Yeah, my name is Robert. I play, I'm a classical and a gospel pianist. I'll do both tonight. Um, probably mostly classical is my main thing. I'll start with that and then at the end, play some Southern gospel improvisations. Um, where am I from, you asked? That's a long story. <laughs> but, well, I grew up in New Jersey, but I got out of there, as you can see, very quickly. Um, but my father's from a long, you know, old Virginia family, Portsmouth, Virginia, for like 10 generations. So he always told me, you're not really in New Jersey and you're Virginian, so it's nice to be in Virginia, another home <laughs> state. And then my mother is from Russia, so I'm uh, half Southeast Virginia and half Russian. That's, and I grew up in New Jersey and now I live in <laughs> It's quite a combination. I live in the North Carolina, I drove up from Mebbin, Alamance County. So, um, but at any rate, I will just talk to you about the pieces I'm gonna play. Some of them are not so well known, some are. And um, I'm doing an odd program right now. And I'll start with a story. So I like to tell stories, maybe too much. Maybe that's a Virginia thing my dad has told me, we love stories. Um, well, I watched a documentary at the start of the pandemic about great violinists of the past, like Yasha Heifetz, or Yehudi Menu, and Nathan Milstein, all the great violin players of, of the past. And I was so moved by it, I said to myself, that's it, I'm gonna become a violinist. I'm sick of piano anyway, it's a giant instrument I can't carry around. Um, the violin, or the fiddle as we call it in the South, I mean, I just love that instrument. So I told my wife, who's a pianist also, I said, look, I'm gonna switch, forget about piano. And she said, well, yeah, you can do it, but it'll probably take you, you have to practice 15 hours a day and it'll take you 10 to 15 years to be any good. I said, oh, well, and we just had our first kid, so I said, forget it, I'm too lazy to do that, I can't, I can't do that. So plan B is to just, was to learn violin music arranged for the piano. And that's what I've been doing. There's some arranged by Franz Liszt and by Rachmaninoff, I'm gonna play some of those. And then there's some other things that are just, you know, originally songs for voice, but you hear it on the violin, or they're originally piano pieces, but you normally hear it played on the, on the violin. So in other words, everything I'm gonna to do tonight is something that violinists play. And that's the sound I have in my mind. I'm just pretending, I'm pretending to be a violinist, basically, um, in this. So, arrangement or transcription, this is, it's a subset of classical you know, composition. And I would describe it like this. It's the same thing as translation in literature. You have a book that's written in, I don't know, French or something. A book of Flaubert, Madame Bovary, is in French, but then someone translates it into English. They're not doing Google Translate. It doesn't, it doesn't flow. A good translation is a reimagining of the text in the new language, so there's a lot of things added to it. A good translator has to be a good writer themselves. So, same for this. What you're gonna hear, they're changed, in some cases, quite a bit from the originals to be piano pieces. So, the first thing I'm gonna play is an odd place to start. I'm gonna play a Japanese folk song that's actually uh, played on the violin frequently. It's called Song of the Seashore by a composer, Narita Tamizo. And the words, of course, I'm not going to sing, and I'm not going to sing in Japanese. I, I don't sing very well. It's, it's actually quite sad how I sing. But um, Song of the Seashore, the words are very nostalgic. It's a man walking along the seashore remembering uh, his past. And this is beautiful melody, which might stick in your ear. It does for me. It's kind of one of those what they call them, earworms. So anyway, I'll start with this and another mellow piece, and then we'll get into some not so mellow things. Um,
Not to criticize Mozart by any means, but some people that found recently that, that um, a lot of Mozart's early pieces, his dad helped a lot, Leopold, daddy helped write them. So, but with Mendelssohn, that was not the case. He just was, it's like he was born and he just started writing. And what I love about Mendelssohn is his, he's very sincere. He wears his heart on his sleeve almost. It's like, he, in this piece, it's like he's just talking through, through the music. Um, in a very genuine way. So May breezes, I guess we had some today, those like humid, slightly humid breezes. Um, the accompaniment just sounds like that, I think. And it's from a set of pieces called Songs Without Words. The right hand is playing what a singer would, would sing, but there's no words. You could maybe imagine what if it had words, what it would be about. Um, at any rate, here is the uh, Mendelssohn uh, May Breeze. Thank you. 
piece originally for violin solo. It's a gavat by Johann Sebastian Bach, arranged for piano by Sergei Rachmaninoff, a Russian composer. So I like to tell stories about composers that are not the Wikipedia stories. So um, it's humorous stories too. So for example, did you know Bach um, spent a night in prison? Probably not. I heard that some time ago and was surprised. The reason is because he pulled a knife on an oboe player at a rehearsal. I just thought that was odd. Even back, you know, he lived 1685 to 1750, but just a detail about him. He also had a fondness for coffee. He wrote a cantata called the Coffee Cantata. Um, he had gotten a hotel bill at one point for copious amounts of fried pork. I wonder, deep fried, I wonder if he'd fit, he'd fit well in the South, maybe. Um, but anyway, in all seriousness though, Bach was a deeply religious composer and person. You know, he was a church musician, and um, at the end of all his works, he, he wrote uh, dedicated to the glory of God. And so here's the thing that the Gavat, which I'm gonna play now, is not a religious piece, it's a secular dance, it's a French Baroque dance. But there's a, a theory that I find very interesting that these dances for solo violin, also solo cello, that he had in mind, in mind scenes from the Bible for each one, in particular scenes from Jesus' life. And so for me, if that was the case for this piece, and I'll play the opening. <laughs> For, for me, it's Palm Sunday, but I, I don't know what it would be for you. You could tell me later. I'm curious to know. I love to think of music as, image, as images, but, um, but that's Bach. And so, of course, the original's for violin, uh, solo, but Rachmaninoff arranged it for piano. So I'll tell you about Rachmaninoff. He was a 20th century Russian composer. And my grandfather actually met him, and Rachmaninoff spoke to him. I'll tell you this story real quick. My grandfather uh, was at dental school in Richmond, Virginia, not too far from here. And um, he was serving as an usher. This was in the 1930s. You know, he was serving as an usher at a concert series, and Rachmaninoff was giving a recital that night. I mean, what I would give to go back in time to, to hear Rachmaninoff play, <laughs> unimaginable. But anyway, the um, story goes that my grandfather was told to guard a pair of doors and not let anyone through. Well, a few minutes later, someone tried to open those doors in the backstage area, so my grandfather pushed the doors, and that person pushed, and there was a fight, really, and then suddenly, wham, the door was kicked open, and it was Rachmaninoff. And I'll tell you, Rachmaninoff, if you see pictures of him, he was six and a half feet tall, he had a shaved head, and he never smiled, and he was Russian. Someone said he looked like an escaped convict. And um, so you know what he said to my grandfather at that moment? He looked at him and he said, get out of my way. So I, have, I tell people I have a personal connection with Rachmaninoff. He said, he spoke to my grandfather. Um, so he arranged this for piano. And it starts close to the Bach original violin piece, but by the end, it gradually transforms into, I think, a Russian-sounding piano piece. It sounds like Russian bells at the end. Um. That's not completely Bach. Some would call this Bachmaninoff because it's Rachmaninoff. I mean, Bach arranged by Rachmaninoff. It's a borderline dad joke there. But um, anyway, here is the uh, Gavat by Bach, arranged by Sergei Rachmaninoff.
works by a controversial composer, this is Niccolo Paganini, here arranged by Franz Liszt. So Paganini was a violinist in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And I say controversial because he was probably more like a rock star of today uh, than a classical musician. Um, some people believed that at the time that he was even possessed because the way he played violin, even the way he looked, there's an old, an early photograph of his, and he has this very long face and wiry hair, and it just was this, you know, very odd and um, strange looking guy. So, and also his musical style, you know, it just comes out of nowhere. It's just his own. You can't trace any influence to it. Um, and the young Franz Liszt was in Paris in the 1830s, and he was actually quite stuck in his life at that time. He was depressed and didn't know what to do um, with himself. And he heard Paganini play. And they say the rest was history. He locked himself in a room to practice, um, you know, hours and hours while reading books, while reading literature. That's a small detail, but he became educated too. And he emerged after a few years as the Franz Liszt that we remember today. And what he did, one of the things he did at that time was to arrange Paganini's violin music for the, for the piano. And that's what I'm going to play some of tonight because he wanted to translate that virtuosity that, that Paganini showed on the violin that he had into the, into the piano. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, this, this music is just frankly crazy. It's very hypercharged, so just putting that out there. It's, um, let's see, I'm gonna play, the first one I'm gonna play is called La Campanella. It's maybe famous or infamous. And Campanella means little bell. You're gonna hear in the upper range. You can hear that little bell. To me, it also reminds me of a, a very annoying fly or mosquito buzzing in my ear at certain points of the piece, because that is a, you know, one of those gnats or something that just doesn't go away. <laughs> Keep, um, and the melody, it's, I would call it snarky. It, it has a, Paganini has a sort of caustic sense of humor, sarcastic sense of humor. This is the, the, the that's sort of the, the tune, if you will. It's the original is from the last movement of the second violin concerto by Paganini. But what Liszt does here is he just changes it. He makes a sort of variation, a fantasy on that idea. So, uh, you know, like I tell when I play this often, this uh, good luck to all of us because this is truly wild uh, music, so here it is.
history of the piece serves as like a hook and it makes the piece to make sense for me but I didn't have that with this so I asked my wife I said what do you what do you hear when I play it I played the opening you know and anyway and she said oh it's simple it's our young youngest cat we have two cats two kids two so four kids you know cat lovers <laughs> You know, uh, and we have this kitten, and he has a toy. It's like a merry-go-round. It's a ball on a string. He whacks it, and it comes around, and then he whacks it again. And just all day, all night, he does it. And that's the piece for me now because it goes, you know, my left hand like that paw, you know. So anyway, <laughs> that's that's how I would describe it. Thank you. 
one more Paganini. This is called La Chasse, which means the hunt. And what you hear are horn calls. And the whole piece is based on that, on those horn calls. Um, horn calls was, you could call it like a musical symbol. We, and we know what it is now because we hear that. And, uh, but there's so much music that has that in it, and usually it's concerned with hunting, you know, which was, I mean, pretty typical activity still now, but probably even more so at that time. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much how I describe it. It's, um, and it's very interesting. In the middle, it imitates the violin, does glissando. Glissando is that, which I do in the gospel sometimes in the Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, way, but that, that's done, it's not usually done um, in classical piano, but it's featured prominently here, so. All right, here it is. Australian composer Percy Granger. 
Percy Granger was to say the least an oddball, I don't think I'll get into it, but um, it's a lovely arrangement in the classical piano manner. So the, the text of the song is presumably is about a father uh, singing to his son who's about to go off uh, to fight in the First World War. So it's a very sad, very uh, you know, moving uh, story behind that, that song. So um, anyway, I hope it sounds like the original uh, because there's a lot of musical fluff added to it in this arrangement. Um, there's also, I, I'm not at the gospel part yet, but there is a uh, hymn, a gospel uh, number that's called He Looked Beyond My Fault. It's the same, it's the same exact tune, so with different words. So here it is. And so this is the famous Humoresque by Antonin Dvorak, which oddly enough, I didn't know this originally, it is a piano piece, but you hardly ever hear it on piano, you hear it on violin. Um, and the, well, the Humoresque means a piece that's humorous, but it's more than just humor, it's whimsical and it's nostalgic, it's, it's somewhat sad in a way too, the way music can be both humorous and, and sad. Dvorak was a Czech composer of the late 19th century, and he was, um, well, he actually spent some time in America. He lived in New York for a while and taught a generation of American composers. And then he put African American, Native American melodies into his uh, New World Symphony. So um, I have a maybe quick story about Dvorak. I know a musician, pianist, who told me that he absolutely hates Dvorak. And I said, well, could you 
tell me why. And he said, well, it's just, and by the way, I'll say that Dvorak, you know, Paganini was probably not a very good person from what I've read. He was, a, you know, not the best person. But Dvorak was, Dvorak was a very humble and good person. So I said, why do you hate him so much? He said, when I hear his music, I feel like I'm on a farm. I can even smell the farm. And I said, you've given me two reasons to love Dvorak even more. Number one, I love farms. And number two, the fact you don't like him so much means that maybe he's, you know, I think it makes him even greater for me. So sometimes music divides opinions. So but anyway, here is um, the humoresque by Dvorak. Southern Gospel. Um, this one is a very short piece called Malagueña by Isaac Albanis. Albanis was Spanish, and he was, 
from what I understand, sort of struggling to find his style. And he was, of course, a great pianist and a great composer, but something he didn't, he couldn't find his own voice. And um, then he tapped into Spanish music. This is about the folk music thing. He, he wrote classical piano pieces based on flamenco music. And that's exactly what you're gonna, what you're gonna hear now. So flamenco is interesting because Spanish, the history of Spain is that it's a melting pot. And in the Middle Ages, it was, it was Moorish, it was Arabic. So the music of the Arabic Middle East is essentially a big, it's a big influence on flamenco music. And um, so Malaga, Malagueña means a woman from Malaga. Malaga is a city in the south of Spain and some people think it's, they call it the capital of flamenco music. So you'll notice um, this sounds like a guitar. You know? And you know, you can hear it. it sounds like some Middle Eastern music too. It just it just has that flavor to it. So um, so here is the uh, the Malaguena by Isaac Albanis. straightforward, but you're going to hear things like, like, you know, gnarly, 
sounds, you know. And I just tell people, look, if you like hot sauce on your uh, food, it's kind of like that. I do. So, but Bartok was very interested in, in folk music, and he went around collecting folk songs with an early tape recorder. And that's what the, this is based on, those experiences. Um, and, you know, Romania, like Spain, it was a melting pot. It was a mixture of gypsy music and klezmer, Jewish klezmer music, and you're gonna hear that in, in this. So I will name you each tune because they have beautiful titles. Very, very short, but there's just like six pieces, six dances. You know, so the first one is called Stick Game, which is, I guess, something that kids would do before um, TVs and iPads do. <laughs> I always imagine when I play these bar top things that I'm in a village somewhere in Eastern Europe and that's, you just have to situate yourself there. Uh, the next one is called um, Romanian peasant, uh, peasant Costume and it goes... Uh, I mean, it's, it's just Eastern European bluegrass. It's, I mean, it's not too different. Um, then we have one that's called Standing Still. And it's um it's kind of eerie and creepy. Like if you're standing out in a in a field somewhere, like where I'm gonna be driving to go home tonight, um, deep in, in Caswell County where there's no towns, it's it's eerie and it's standing still. The next one is called Mountain Corn Song, and to me it sounds like a definite klezmer clarinet. So we have. I think it's a very sad piece. It's a very moving piece. Then the last two are quite upbeat. The, last, the second to last one's called. Um, it's called Romanian Garden Gate. I always forget. <laughs>
Saint-Saëns. He was a French composer, late 19th century, and he was um, brilliant. He was also a philosopher, a mathematician, an archaeologist. He did all these things, and he was a child prodigy. When he was 10 years old, he gave his first recital in Paris, and at the end of the program, he said to the audience, which of the 32 Beethoven sonatas would you like me to play? I have them all memorized. What a brat! <laughs> to say that. Anyway, so um, here is his etude on, on the vault. I think it's, it could be uh, the music to a silent film, or uh, you know, Buster Keaton, or Charlie Chaplin, or um, it would work very well for the Looney Tunes of Tom and Jerry because it's got extremes of mood and they shift very quickly, so it goes from being almost tender to being sort of violent, even. It just, it's all over the place, and it's a lot of fun, I would say, this piece. It's a funny and entertaining piece. <laughs> Thank you. 
Southern Gospel pieces to close. Uh, I don't know. Do you want to hear In the Garden? Do you want to hear Amazing Grace? Um, just a few names of things. You know, Why Me, Lord, by Chris Christopherson. Or maybe Bessie sometimes will do that. You know. um,
quick one. I'll do a real quick one because I may, might be having stayed too long here, so I'm sorry. This is um, Jesus Hold My Hand by Albert E. Brumley. The opening is great. I'm going to do a country gospel, a um, little bit of a tribute to Jerry Lee Lewis who played gospel magnificently, so he died about a year ago. So here it is. So thank you all for coming tonight, and I guess he's going to be here for a minute. Y'all might have questions oh, yeah, for him, or I don't know. I mean, my question is, how long have you been playing? Oh, forever. Forever since yeah, you were since like born. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it seems much. real obvious he's been playing forever, and it just seems so yeah. effortless. Oh, well, thank um, you. And you just do such a beautiful job. So uh, that is amazing. Y'all have any thank questions for him? No? I don't remember why I was 